We're on 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13 this morning. We're going to be on this one for two, maybe three weeks. Uh, there's a lot in chapter 5. Uh, and there's a lot of things that sometimes we read it right off the bat and we think, oh, this is the point of this, and, and it's not. And there's other things to be considered in these verses. I want to prepare you for this first section of Scripture because of the fact that uh, Paul has learned a lot and seems to want us to clear our minds, open our ears, and learn from him, thereby from God, in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians. I want to say right off the bat that if you are primarily concerned with the sexual immorality addressed in these verses, you're going to miss much of what Paul is trying to say. Now, here's what I mean by that. If you're not practicing the sin being committed, we can tend to think we are safe. And Paul's point is that when you think you are standing, you may be falling. Sin is sneaky. Sin can be sexual immorality, but it can also be the pride that makes you think you are above it. Here Paul is concerned mainly with two primary things, the sin being tolerated in the midst of the Corinthian church, there are two that he's thinking of, sexual immorality and pride. And number two, the lack of discipline being practiced by the church. Mainly because he knows that when it comes to sin, first we tolerate it, then we laugh at it, then we let it into our living room, then we let it into our hearts. The progression of sin is so dangerous that approaching it flippantly or prideful can be our downfall. So we're going to talk today about the problem of the leaven in the lump. Let me pray for us. We'll read our verses and get into the meat of our message today. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Thank you for today. Thank you for the ability to come and worship as we are this morning. Lord, I thank you for your word that we get to study and learn from and apply in our lives. Lord, I pray that today as we approach these verses, Lord, that we would read them with an understanding that we can be in the place of the Corinthians at any moment if we start to view sin wrongly or if we start to view you wrongly. Lord, I pray for protection of our church and for our hearts as we study, Lord, that it's not pride or arrogance that characterizes what we're reading or hearing, but Lord, it's humility and repentance and a willingness, Lord, to come back to what it is you've called us to and to live that out in front of people. Lord, be with the reading of your word and the teaching of it, Lord. Help it to penetrate hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13 says, It is actually reported to me that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among pagans. For a man has his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. For though absent in the body, I am present in spirit, and if in spirit, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival, not with the old leaven, the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater, a reviler, a drunkard, or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. 
For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not the inside, not those inside the church whom you are to judge? God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Paul's points in these come from a very interesting viewpoint, and it's one we need to really understand. Two things that I really think he's trying to teach us, and it's important for us to understand his viewpoint going in. Paul had been a devout Jew. He understood what a covenantal God is. And he seemed to recognize that maybe the Corinthians didn't understand a covenantal God. We see his devoutness displayed in verses like Acts 23.6. It says, Now when Paul perceived the one part where Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. He then says again in 22.3, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Sicily brought up in this city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. His Jewish heritage included his heritage, his discipline, and his zeal. He had grown up being subject to those things. Philippians 3, 4 through 6 says that, I, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. I tell you all this because it's important to remember that Paul wrote this letter out of genuine concern for the church. He understood what it was like to go against a covenantal God. That God is holy and we're supposed to be holy because we claim to be his people. He had witnessed, read about, and been privy to teachings that helped him to understand what happened to Israel when they went counter of God. When they ignored God and His commands. That care that Paul had for the early church grew out of true, two truths that he knew very well. First, God had accomplished our salvation through the person and work of Jesus Christ. He knew that was true. He knew, just like we talked about last, night, last week, we owe all we have and will be to Jesus. He knew that. Beyond a shadow of a doubt, it comes through in his teachings, it comes through in his writings, it even comes through, comes through in the writings of others about Paul. Second, he understood we serve a covenantal God. I know I've said it before, but it bears repeating. God loves us unconditionally, but he does not accept us unconditionally. He accepts us based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. Sometimes we get that backwards today in our society. You know, to love someone is to accept everything that they do. That's not the God we serve. Christ died because we needed to be perfect to stand before God, and we could not be. He loves us unconditionally, but He does not accept us unconditionally. He accepts us based on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And we dare not discount the holiness of our God, which is where this confusion usually comes. We think love should make Him lower His standards, that He's suddenly not the God that we read about in all of Scripture. Nothing has changed in Him. What has changed has happened to us. We are the ones covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're the ones who find forgiveness in His work. Belief 
in the work of Christ on the cross was the condition of our salvation. He loved us enough to send Christ. Us accepting Christ is the condition by which we can stand before a holy God. Paul knew very well what God was like and how he viewed his covenants with his people. That belief is evident because we are set apart from the world. Luke 22, 19 and 20 says, He took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, This is my body which is given to you given for you, do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. We still serve a covenant God. Paul's concern here is the purity of the church. Whether we're striving for holiness or not, and In the Corinthian church, not only were they not striving for it, but they seemed to almost be laughing at it or boasting about the fact that they weren't that person. Yet therefore we must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. It tells us in Romans 5, 48. Romans 12, 1 says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. The Corinthians thought they were so smart, but they should have been mourning the presence of sin in their midst. At times, I think we still struggle with that today in the church. We are extremely good at pointing out the sin of those outside the church and extremely inept at pointing out the sin of those inside the church. Paul reminds them, what business do we have judging those outside the church? But yet those that call themselves Christian, who claim to be brothers and sisters in Christ, those are who we're supposed to call out sin in their lives. Sin is not something to be tolerated in the life of believers. Too often we view or take for granted the covering that we receive from God that This flow will just continuously wash away every sin, so it doesn't matter what we do. That's why Paul says, we are not saying, as some accuse us, to sin more so grace may abound more. But when we take it for granted, we'll tolerate sin. Not just in their lives, but in our lives. Sinners saved by grace in the beginning and saints walking with the power of the Holy Spirit now. And that's who we're supposed to be. We acknowledge the fact that we were all sinners when we came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. But we are now saints walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're supposed to be being renewed day after day. Becoming more and more like Christ. We are set apart from the world. John, 1 John 1, 5 and 10 says, This is the message we have heard from Him and proclaim to you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with Him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus His Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar. And His word is not in us. The Corinthians in chapter 5 seem to be boasting about their purity compared to this other brother who was involved in this sin. They were saying they had no sin trying to point out someone else's to make theirs look less. It's a practice we are entirely too good at today as well. 
We overcome sin in our lives by confession and repentance, not by denial and highlighting other people's sin. You will never experience the cleansing power of Jesus Christ while you're too busy trying to condemn someone else. Confess what your sins are, repent of those sins, and you will feel and experience a peace that you cannot buy with any amount of money or find in any group. Or... We are perfect. We are not perfect, but we are striving to be more like Christ. Christ is sinless, therefore we strive to be sinless. That's an individual journey that's supported and encouraged by our other brothers and sisters in Christ. But the discussion about sin and confessions of it need to be between you and God. But Paul also seemed to understand the sin's infectious nature. The leaven is oftentimes, I think, kind of characterized a little bit wrong when you go back and read what the actual word was and the practice. Sometimes we think of it as yeast. Like you add yeast to bread. And then the yeast causes the bread to rise. But that's not the way leaven was done. Leaven was fermented dough. And then they would take a piece of it and put it in the new lump when they made it to create leavened bread. So it was a fermentation that was taken from one lump and put into another one and then kneaded through so that it would take hold and produce what it was meant to produce. We think of yeast and it's not exactly yeast. It's much more like an infection. Something that was contaminated, fermented over here, and we're going to take it and put it in over here. And Paul is saying, don't you know that a little leaven will ruin the whole lump? The same thing happens when we take a little bit of sin, and it's okay. We tolerate it in our lives. We tolerate it in other people's lives. And then we wonder why things start going the way they go. We wonder why we start seeing or feeling distance between us and God. We wonder why we see the Word of God not being as powerful as it once was in our witness to the world around us. We wonder why we've lost some of our ability to show, display, and witness to the transforming power of the Spirit. Sometimes it's because a little leaven has gotten into the lump. And then it just continues to infect us. 1 Corinthians 5.1 says it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and the kind of sexual immorality that's not even tolerated among the Gentiles. A man is sleeping with his father's wife. Paul speaks of the Gentiles, which the majority of this church had been, but he clearly thinks of them no longer but he is saying, look, even the Gentiles from where you came wouldn't tolerate this type of sin. But here you are, boasting, arrogant, and allowing it to stay. Even the Gentiles would not tolerate incest in such a manner. There was laws that existed both in Corinth and in the Roman uh, civilization in general that made these things punishable. And inside the church, they seem to be being tolerated. There's a difference between what happens in the world and what happens in the church, and that's Paul's point here. The church is supposed to look different. It's supposed to be different than the world around it. It's not perfect. We're going to do things wrong. We're going to say things wrong. We're going to find ourselves in sin, but we're supposed to be different. The divorce rate inside the church is relatively the exact same as it is outside the church. The amount of abuse that is perpetrated in homes is about equal inside the church as it is outside the church. The amount of people that become addicted to drugs or alcohol inside the church is roughly the same as those that do so outside the church. 
there's leaven in the lump. We don't look much different than the world around us. He says in 5, 11 through 13, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. If he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or is an idolater or reviler or drunkard or swindler, not even to eat with such a one. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? Is it not those inside the church whom you are to judge? Judge, God judges those outside. Purge the evil person from among you. Ephesians 5, 3 says, But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Something we are told, some things we are told are clear sins and should be avoided. Some things in Scripture are less clear, and some are even permitted through church history and have later been deemed to be forbidden. But here in Corinth, a sin known for sexual sin to the point that there was a slanderous word called to be Corinthianized, which just meant that you became sexually permissive, or explorative, was a byword for immoral excesses of the worst kind. Paul is saying even those immoral people would not tolerate the type of sin that was going on in the church. And rather than the church being appalled and mourning that fact, they were proud and boasting and who they were, and what they knew, what all they had accomplished. Sin will always infect more than the area it starts in. It will always do that. It's like gangrene. There's a reason why so many times when they remove a body part for gangrene, they have to go back and do it again, and then again, and then again, because it got past where they thought it had stopped and often for us sin is exactly the same way you are a new batch you are made new in Christ the song we just sang a little bit ago said his blood has made us white as snow and yet we will drag in sin We will tolerate it in our midst. And sometimes we think it needs to be something like sexual immorality. But I can tell you that gossip and slanderous talk and being malicious and evil towards one another, all of those things are leaven as well. We worship a holy God. We're supposed to be set apart. Our aim should be holiness. Holiness. And it will take all of us to get there because we're going to need encouragement to be able to do that. The sins of the world have a tremendous pull. If they didn't have a tremendous pull, it would be easy to resist. Paul's main point is sin allowed will spread. You see that through other epistles that he writes. He reiterates it more times than not. Sin allowed will spread. When it is present in our midst, the proper attitude is mourning, not pride. When we know there are brothers and sisters in sin, or we ourselves are in sin, it's not pride that should characterize our demeanor. It's mourning, it's repentance, it's a willingness to humble ourselves before our God and say, why us as a body? Because it's our body. We let it into our body, much like gangrene. So if our leg has got gangrene, we all have it. We're supposed to mourn and repent over that. Pray for the brother or sister that is struggling with that sin. Do all that we can to help remove that sin from our midst even to the point, at times, of putting someone out of the church. 
so that, like he says, the sin can come to its end or the flesh can come to its end and the person will return to Christ and be saved in the end. A tree without fruit or a tree with bad fruit, both are in danger. We're told that in Scripture multiple times by Jesus himself. We're also told by Jesus and by Paul and by Peter and by James that we can recognize people by their fruit. Are they real believers, true believers in Christ? That if they are, they'll have some kind of fruit. Not always a lot of fruit, but they'll have some kind of fruit. But a tree with no fruit or bad fruit is in trouble. And we should mourn that fact. Not celebrate the fact that we're not them. Especially if they're a part of us. A part of our church. A part of our gathering. How can the, Christian, or the Corinthians be so proud as to actually be having the debates about who was the better preacher while this type of sin went on? It causes Paul to be almost incredulous sin will always affect spread more from where it started it will always affect more I maybe have told this story before but I can remember reading in a history book but Eskimos used to have a very unique way of killing wolves that would come and raid their storage places where they had put their food because back then they stored it by digging a hole in the ice and putting it in the ice wolves could smell it up to a foot deep in ice they would come and dig it out so they took a blade a knife they would dip it in water and snow and let it freeze and then pour blood all over it and then do it again and then do it again and do it again to where you had this basically a blood popsicle and the wolf would come and find it and he would lick it and lick it and lick it until he finally started to cut his own tongue and then the blood he was so ravenously going after was his own and sin does the same thing sin will make you think you're getting what you want and then the door will shut the judgment will come and you will burn. And that should always cause us as believers to mourn, to repent, to confess, to move forward in our lives in a way that helps others see, recognize, and escape the sin that they're ensnared in. It's not to laugh at, it's not to feel prideful in the fact that we don't commit that particular sin. It's to remember that we worship a holy God. And our pursuit is holiness. Our aim is perfection. We are going to come up short, but then we thank God for the grace, for the blood, for the covering that we have in Christ, but it doesn't stop our pursuit of holiness. 